Garden Gurus Live is brought to you by Garden Express and Troforte. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail ordering service, offering a wide range of quality gardening products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Troforte is the leading supplier of controlled release fertilisers and micronutrients and it's committed to delivering environmentally friendly solutions for your garden. Each week we'll be giving away a Troforte prize pack valued at $250. Simply follow, like and comment the weekly code word on Troforte's Facebook page. Well, good morning. Welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Trevor Cochran. It's great to have you with us. I've got a very special guest joining me today. Now, you know, each week, generally we'll do a cross to the guys at Garden Express. We end up catching up with David Van Berkel. Now, I know a lot of you love David, but not many of you will have met Chloe Van Berkel. Chloe? Hi, how are you going, Good. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Chloe's over here in Perth. I'm back down from Singapore, and thanks very much for watching us last week. We had some amazing questions coming in from all over the place. In the last week, the Garden Gurus has moved office. We've actually just reset ourselves up. We're still got a little bit of fine tuning to do. So be patient with us if things are not quite perfect. Now we have met you. We've got this amazing uh, competition with Troforte, $250 um, basically hamper. It's absolutely brilliant. Good morning, Christine Rankin. Um, but we've also got our Garden Express $50 gift voucher. And of course, the great thing about Garden Express, you can shop 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? You absolutely can. Yeah, that's, it's the convenience is just amazing. Of course, we all really fell in love with that um, sort of through COVID times. I think so many more people discovered you through that period of time. But Garden Express, uh, it's got quite the history attached to it, hasn't it? You know, you're it 22 years old. We are 22 years uh, online through our web store, Garden yep. Express, but we have been at Mombolk at our Garden Express site for the last 70 years. Right, as Van Berkel. As Van Berkel. Yeah. So now take us back because your family business, and this is one of the things that makes the garden industry so good, is that pretty much all the businesses are family businesses. The big corporates are a bit unusual. They're, they're now starting to play a role. But definitely, you know, for 70 years, your family has been servicing especially the bold needs of Australian gardeners. But even before that, in Holland, before before you, what your opa came? So my great opa came from Holland 70 years ago uh, with his brother. He brought bulbs from Holland to uh, Mombolk mm -hmm. uh, because he knew that the climate and the soil was perfect conditions for growing bulbs. Uh, so 70 years ago, they started growing in that area, uh, and along with growing. other families with, from Holland as well. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. that, that whole region's got a lot of yes. a lot of uh, uh, families that um, have brought their their skills out. But his story, how he started selling the flowers, is a good story too, isn't it? It is. So basically, he was growing his bulbs and uh, the cut flowers. He would take to the back of the Coles Group at the time. Uh, and try and sell them to the stores. So through the, basically through the back door of the store. Through the back door. Oh my God. Uh, eventually, one of the stores took them and started selling them. He got sprung by one of the buyers of the Coles Group and said, you have to actually do this properly. Uh, so eventually, he got in with the Coles Group and started selling the bulbs and the flowers. And Coles Group was, well, still is, but I mean, was, was huge back then. And, and there was a supermarket in every neighbourhood. So people would be buying sort of daffodils and tulips, hyacinths. Uh, yes, all, all of those spring yeah. flowering bulbs. But, but initially as flowers and then as bulbs, started bundling them up yes. as bulbs. Yes. And I reckon your family would have touched just about every household in Australia over the decades because we've all bought bulbs at some point. But before Garden Express came along, it was sort of by the old fashioned catalogue too, wasn't it? It was. Uh, and we also have been uh, in Kmart when Kmart used to have uh, the nursery side of the business. Yeah. Uh, that eventually uh, came to our web store, Garden Express. Mm. And it sort of was spring flowering bulbs. Then you sort of developed a summer flowering bulb range so that we you were did. supplying so that year round. In the downtime, uh, 
Opa wanted to make sure that his fields had something in them. So we eventually uh, encompassed some flowering bulbs. So we grew dahlias, dahlia tubers, uh, and then eventually hippiastrum bulbs. Uh, and now that is my father's side of the business that He's very passionate. He's very no, passionate I, about. I filmed out on the farm, obviously, mm. not that long ago, and um, the hippiastrums are a crazy beautiful flowering bowl. Absolutely. Still relatively unknown for most home gardeners, but it's one of those ones you kind of put it in and just let it do its thing because it'll keep producing these beautiful, huge flowers. But you can do it in the garden or you can do it in a pot and bring it indoors as well. You can. And you can also grow it in a, a vase with water, so no soil, uh, for the first year of its life. Mm -hmm. You can have it inside uh, and it will continue to grow two to three uh, stems, which all have beautiful, massive flowers. Now, initially, um, it was all about bulbs uh, with the online store and then that evolved and, you know, it started to become other things. Suddenly we discovered this this rare plant, the Wallamai pine, and David was uh, very quick to realise, okay, well, this needs to be very carefully managed and distributed to not just across Australia, but across the world. You guys have had a significant impact in the redistribution of Wallamai pines, which, you know, have been around for at least 250 million years and then disappeared. And uh, now that the nursery, we were just out there filming recently, um, you've got thousands of them. We do. Uh, so we're really passionate about the conservation of the Wollamai pine. We have been growing and propagating the Wollamai pine for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it was found by David Noble uh, in the Wollamai National Forest 30 years ago next year. So um, we're, we're very passionate about ensuring that every Australian uh, has a Wollamai pine in their backyard uh, because it is a national treasure. It is a national treasure and um, and certainly something that it's one of those moments in time where there was less than a hundred left in the wild. Um, we had those huge bushfires a few years ago where they were nearly wiped out yes. then um, but thankfully we rediscovered them, you're propagating them, they're now being distributed to, to people right across the country which again they can do online. So this is the evolution of Garden Express, you went from Bulb Express to Garden Express yes and you started picking out a lot of other things. You have a long family history, like all the other nurseries do, of working with each other as well. So you were picking, yes. you know, starting to pick some of those key specialised lines, maybe some that are not in huge quantities, but that people could get their hands on by going online and shopping. Absolutely. So we're always trying to find new and exciting products and bulbs, plants. Uh, we have uh, a large customer base that is always looking to increase the special bulbs yep. in their garden uh, and yeah like I said we're always looking to try and find the next best and that even that even evolved though to fertilizers to Absolutely. you know good quality garden tools that's um, become a big addition to your range Our so. gardeners advantage range uh, has become quite extensive uh, and we're always looking to have really good quality garden tools that we can give to our customers. And the reason why I wanted Chloe to come in, and she does, she she didn't want to be dragged in and put on <laughs> screen, so I've got to be completely upfront. So I, I threw under the wagon a little bit, but um, the the bit with with this is that you guys are a family business, and you are now what the fourth generation. Yes. So Hank was my great opa. Joss is my opa. Uh, David Van Beckel is my father. Uh, and then my son will be fifth generation wow. that's, <laughs> eventually. That's, that's such a cool story. Yeah. And there's an important part to that. And that is that when we do shop online, sometimes it feels like it's impersonal. But first of all, everything that's that's available online has been carefully curated by yourself or David or Rowan, you know, who's also part of the family. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a really nice touch to it. But if something's not right or somebody needs a little bit of extra help, you're still a family business. They can contact you and ask questions Absolutely. or, you know, raise anything that they're concerned about or if they're looking for something, maybe raise that as well. Yeah, so many of our family members have key positions within the business with uh, my aunties and uncles, um, my nan and pop, uh, nana and opa, mum and dad, uh, my sister, my husband, they all work for the business. Uh, and we like to keep it 
personable uh, and really show that we are family. We are a family business. And you're still operating from the same location. We are still operating from Mombok. Um, we provide 24-7 uh, website uh, and we have a team in our customer service that are always willing to answer any questions that you have. That's fantastic. Yeah. Now, speaking of questions, I know there's going to be a lot of people asking questions, but I've got one more for you. We've got a special offer going uh, on the show this week, uh, especially for Garden Guru viewers. So tell us what it is. Okay, so we have uh, two Protea collections, uh, a Protea collection and a Leucodendron collection, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, we have them in 75 mil pots. They are 25% off uh, for the Garden Gurus customers. Uh, and that is only $38 for the three plants. That's a collection. savings. Normally it's $50.70 and it's down to $38. It's a really good deal. And when we did this this time last year, sell out they just sold out i know the same thing happened last week with fuchsias i know it's going to happen this week if you want to get your hands on the protea collection if you want to get your hands on the leucodendron collection both spectacular plants originating from from africa mostly south africa um really stunning i think there's some waratahs sitting in in the collection as well if i remember correctly and waratahs are of course an iconic Australian plant too, but a member of that protea family. So That's right. really cool. They do really well with our Australian environment. We're quite similar to the southern parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so people do sometimes confuse them as Australian native. Mm -hmm. uh, they're native to southern Africa, but the climates are quite similar, so we can grow them here. And probably one of the most important things to remember is that if you're buying them, online you can also grab all of my pine because they actually have the same fertilized and nutritional requirements they don't like too much phosphorus yes. so you've got to use that special native fertilizer if you want to get great results out of them absolutely mm. okay well chloe thank you so much for coming in thank you, you did an awesome job Thanks it wasn't that bad me. was it <laughs> she was so nervous and i was like don't be nervous you know you, you know your thank stuff you. which is great and thank um you. it's lovely it's such a great family business thank you and you guys, um, you've been an amazing supporter of us. We really appreciate it. It gives us the ability to, to do what we're doing here this morning, but also to, to share advice and information with gardeners right across Australia with our TV show each week. And that's really what the Van Burkle family have been doing for Australian gardeners for sure. 70 years, four generations. They're very passionate about it. Mm. Well, well done. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm going to let you go and I'll get Thank on you. and start answering some of these questions because they're coming you. through thick and fast. Thank you. Thanks, Chloe. Well done. <laughs> Yeah, can you believe she was nervous? I can't believe it. She did good. She did good. Okay, let's. Where do we start? Um, well, boy, there's a lot of questions coming through. Let's just roll this up and have a look here. Well, good morning. First of all, we've got to say good morning to Tyson Sanders and Brodia. Good morning, mate. You always come in first. You and Christine Rankin, you are just such great supporters. Love it. I can see Christine's already asked a question a bit further down the line. Um, let's have a look at the questions that are flowing through. Um, where do we start? We will start with the question Tyson asked, and that's, can I plant a lemon tree in the ground um, or pots of wine barrels or something else? Well, I can tell you coming up in... Uh, ooh, hang on. Let's just have a look and see whether we... Um, we're still live, aren't we? Everything's all okay? Yeah, I just had a little warning come up. Um, the the question you're asking is a really good one. And we're just about to do a story actually uh, with some beautiful new dwarf varieties uh, that are coming through. Um, we, will, we will make sure that we're um, putting that up. I think it's in two weeks time when it'll become apparent. These are perfect for growing in pots and wine barrels. If you don't have a big garden, Maybe, maybe um, it's a good idea for you to um, to grow them in a in, you know, grow these dwarf varieties in a smaller garden. They do produce a lot of fruit, Tyson, so you can't go wrong. So keep your eye out for the dwarf forms of citrus. They are the best. Now uh, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Hopefully we are all live and it's all flowing okay. Because I do keep getting a warning telling me that we are unresponsive which we love being responsive Are you all okay there okay i've got shaley here producing
there we go we are back that's okay there was definitely some sort of problem there hopefully uh, we're over that um now where do we start let's get back to your questions um yes kaz jones you did lose us but we are back um, yes, Julia, we are back. Thank you. Keep sending your questions through because I think I've just lost a few of them and I want to make sure that we um, we are answering everything you're asking. Um, Matthew's telling us our oh, YouTube may not be working, so I forget to mention that we do actually broadcast through YouTube as well. Um, Christine, you have asked this question. You're in Sterling and it's a really good question. You can see a photograph is sitting right here. And it's, I'm not sure what's wrong with this frangipani cutting. I'm going to cut it off, but I'm wondering if I leave it now, cut it off later, or just go ahead and do it. Look, my gut feeling is that that plant has rotted, that cutting has rotted. You could cut it down to ground level. I suspect that you'll find the rots all the way through to the roots. But but do it, do it now, Christine, because you've only got about a month or so for this to seal off, hopefully harden up. Tyson, uh, your question was about the wine barrels or, you know, it's a lemon tree. Go for one of the dwarfs. Um, just thinking about varieties, lots of lemons, um, sublime, uh, lemonicious. There's about four or five of these beautiful dwarf trees now. Get to about 1.5 metres high by 1.5 metres wide. And they produce lots and lots of fruit. Now your questions are flowing through like crazy. Thank you very much. Um, Jenny, I'm not sure where you're from. I should mention, please tell me where you're from. It does help when I'm answering your questions. Um, but I planted watermelon seeds and the vines grew, but the flowers kept dying. Any clues? Well, basically it sounds to me more like it's a pollination issue for you, Jenny. And sometimes with something like watermelons, planting some things around the outside, uh, the good example would be things like calendulas um, or the tagetes, any of the African marigolds, bring a lot of bees in, gets good pollination, but more often than not, um, vines that like watermelons and pumpkins and, and uh, cucumbers, etc. the times when they don't perform is usually when they're a bit shaded. So just a little bit of a little bit of advice there, keep them in full sun. Cheryl Lee, I'm not sure where you're from either. Good morning to you though, and it's great to have you join us. So I'm going to gain some help with a weeping cherry tree planted in spring over the past two to three months, it's lost all its leaves. I was spraying sea salt every two weeks to try and help reduce stress on the plant, but unfortunately, it doesn't to appear to have helped. Surely, I would say I'm not. It would really help me a lot if you um, just post where you're from. It will help answer. But I suspect that what you've got here is a combination of dry heat stress and. It's not uncommon for drier locations to have this kind of behaviour. Um, actually, you're in Albury. Uh, so, Albury, you're in New South Wales. Okay, well, this is definitely a drying um, stress for sure. Uh, I feel very confident now to give you that advice. I would suggest to you that, you know, you should be mulching around the soil. It will probably be in some kind of sort of um, state of dormancy almost at the moment. It, it hopefully hasn't died off. It's just um, stressed and shut down. The sea sol is a good idea and does help. However, um, this time of the year, it's not really um, going to make any difference. It needs to rest through the winter and then come springtime, hopefully you will see a fair bit of growth. You could go through and if you can see some any obvious dead wood, prune that out and hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully it's survived. It's a really big challenge with, uh, with particularly the weeping cherries. Uh, they're a lot more sensitive to heat stress and, uh, and drought. So please, uh, mulching around the base of them, keeping the moisture up to them. It's more about consistency and moisture in the soil and don't feed them. So sea salt is not a, a, a food, it is a plant tonic or a soil tonic and it's going to help plants recover from stress. So uh, you've been applying it, I wouldn't do any more now, I'd let it rest. Sarah, not sure where you're from. How do you know when to harvest sweet potatoes? Generally, it's because the vine dies back as we move into cooler conditions. And then, you know, the soil will be full of sweet potatoes, but you can dig around. If you lift it, you'll see where they're, they're in and you can dig in around the roots and you'll know very quickly if you've got tubers in the soil. Tyson, my question, and one more Tyson question already. That's great. Uh, can I please plant a wall of my pine tree in the ground or somewhere else? Can you please give me some tips and advice? Shame Chloe's not here because they really know them far better than, than most people. Um, 
they've got some amazing Wollamai pines in their nursery. And the thing that I learned from that is it loves rich soil types. And if your soil's a nice, rich loam, it'll do really, really well. It does require free draining uh, soils. The other thing is that um, needs to be planted in shade. Okay, so a lot better to be protected by shade and ideally from strong winds as well. Um, hopefully that helps. Glenn sent us uh, this particular um, photo. He's got this weed in the lawn. You can see it. I couldn't quite identify it. I had a close up look as much as I could. It wasn't quite as, as close as I'd like to have a look, but there is some advice I can give you. You've been using glyphosate and it will knock it around, I'm absolutely certain. But my suggestion would be try, because it's in the lawn, try weed and feed. Now, it's a broadleaf, so the weed and feed is going to either significantly set it back or wipe it out altogether. But um, I would love you to do this and then come back in a couple of weeks' time and tell us what the immediate effect was. You should see quite a significant effect. Kaz from Baker's Hill, which is in WA, uh, asked about, that's right, mealybug on, uh, you think they'll win flowers? Um, you sent through some photographs. You can see right here, that is definitely mealybug. You've definitely got an infestation. White oil in a plant like this is probably going to be the most effective way of getting rid of it. There are some systemic insecticides you can get from your local garden centre that's very effective with mealybug. But the trick with this is to drench the mealybug with a white oil. And that'll move down the stem and it should wipe them out, hopefully, altogether. When you see it that bad, often you'll also see it in the root system. So if you've got a couple of plants where you can dig, check the roots out without actually killing them or damaging them too badly, then that would be the way I'd go. Um, let's go, Michaela. I'm not sure where you're from, Michaela. You guys got to let me know where you're from. We're going all over the country. Um, I've got a few tomatoes and, and they've been growing some now for weeks. They've grown quite a bit of fruit, but they're still really green. I'm pretty sure it's the black crim tomato. Now, that black crim, because it, it does change colour to a black colour, um, it tends to stay green really, really late. And more often than not, even when it's green but fully mature, it'll be ready to be able to be eaten. Um, but my suggestion to you would be that um, just wait. You will see that blush come through, and it's really the next four weeks, I would suggest, um, when you'll see them come through. It should be fine. Nikki, um, you're in Tassie, which is great. Hello to everybody in Tassie. It's the best time to give roses a big chop, mainly to try and eliminate mould. All right, well, to be quite honest, you could give them a bit of a hack back now. There is a bit of growth left in them and they might flush if you've got reasonably warm conditions, Nikki. They might flush one more dose of flowers. And Julie from Tassie is asking the same question. Um, when's the best time to prune roses? To give them their annual hard prune, it's really going to be, I always say here in Western Australia, it's the last week of July because July is our coldest month. So I always prune them back. I let them go dormant during the winter, prune them back in the last week of July. If you prune them earlier, they will start to put out new growth. And there is a risk that that can get burned off by frost, which is why I always push back on that on those dates. Okay, let's have a bit of a look here. Albert in Cannington, regarding winter bulbs, when is actually the earliest time of the year to harvest bulbs? Um, is it really until all the leaves die down? The reason for asking, I wanted to replace the winter bulbs with summer bulbs last year. However, you waited till December and the anemones and Dutch irises still had lots of leaves. Even the anemones were flowering in December, which is very unusual, by the way. Um, we in, so Cannington is in West Australia and West Australia had a very mild summer compared to the year before, which was the hottest summer on record. The year before, they would have all died down in December. This year, definitely not. They would have tried to continue on growing. Um, the best time is probably going to be December, January. And even if you've got to cut back the foliage, it's worthwhile doing. Hopefully that'll help. Um, Matthew, you're in Melbourne West. Is it a good idea to have both tropical plants and vegetables in a sprout or greenhouse? And what watering system is recommended? Well, I've got to tell you, sprout or greenhouses are sensational. They are a great way to grow all sorts of things. And when you're in Melbourne, um, cool winters, really quite cool, growing um growing your, your veggies, growing tropical plants, and, and that could be fruit too, things like pawpaw or pineapple, 
they go really well in the Sproutwell greenhouse. Um, the, the glass house in particular is amazing. I'm getting a new one for my garden because um, I've, I've actually got one, but I want to have another one for more for propagation and also growing winter vegetables. So it'll be perfect. Um, watering system, you can have a, a, an internal misting system. Uh, they do have this amazing Sproutwell um, pot. And I've been saying to the guys at Sproutwell, seriously, this is such a great watering system. It's it's got a it's a self watering system, and they plug into each other. So you just need to plug in some polytube into one side, and each pot will fill up its its well, and you'll see it's got a little level. It'll tell you when it's starting to run low on water. So you can either manually turn it on, or alternatively set it so it runs once a week or something like that. Hopefully that helps. Um, they are really really good pots. Uh, let's go. Uh, we're in the northern suburbs of WA, and this is Ellen. Hello, Ellen. Good morning to you too. Got a mango in a large pot that fruited well this year. I'd like to change the soil. Not sure if it's a good idea to take it out and change over the soil. Hopefully yield fruit again for next season. Let me know your thoughts, please. Every two years, you should change the potting mix in most of your pots. That's the first thing. Mangoes are exceptionally productive, so they desperately need to have their soil changed every couple of years. My advice, however, is you do not do it going into winter. If you damage any of the root system, you will set the mango back. What you want to do is wait until it gets warm, probably October, November, repot it back, you know, then and let it take off and grow in the, in the new soil. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that should help. Christina, hello, Christina, you're in Collie. It's great to have you join us this morning. Half of my azalea is dead, but part of the plant still has green leaves. Okay, probably indicates that you've had either a fungal infection. So just check the base of the um, of the azalea for a start to make sure you don't have any mulch up against the base because sometimes that'll happen. Sometimes that'll happen because there's a dry patch in the soil and those roots on that side that service the foliage on that side are now dead and that foliage will die. Um, what I would suggest you do, wetting agent, sea sole, give it a really good soak. Make sure that when you put the wetting agent in, you're hosing it, you're seeing this bubbling coming up because that's any air pockets, any dry patches in the soil that will be fixed. That's that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that any of that dead wood, you are best to prune it off because it'll encourage regrowth back onto the other side. Um, Christina, I hope that helps. Ken, we're getting a few in Perth this week. Um, Good morning, Trevor. Um, I bought a pot of native hibiscus about two months ago, which has been flowering and was growing well until recent weather change. So we've just had a change from quite a mild summer to actually quite cool conditions. It's now looking withered, but still green. I've given it some Seamunga solution, but doesn't seem to improve. Is there any hope of saving the poor plant? Well, it depends on what type of native hibiscus. Unusual for a true native hibiscus to go like that this time of the year and again i would check things like i'd be making sure that um, water is evenly getting into the soil uh the second thing so wetting agent uh second thing is sea mungus a seaweed solution is going to help a lot in root recovery if there's been some damage done um, conditions are not that cool for a hibiscus to set back and most native hibiscus don't set back in cool conditions anyway so um, maybe king send me a photograph I would love that. And I'll have a look and I'll come back to you next week. Craig, you are in Victoria uh, in the Macedon Ranges. It's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. You're asked after some advice on beating pear and cherry slug. I've got a row of four metres plus cherry plums. I've been smashed by them for the past two years. Um, they're going dormant now. What should I do? Okay, so the first thing you need to know is that um, the, the cherry slug is a very difficult thing to control but the way you do control it is you actually use something that so slugs are a, a um, mollusk so they're like snails and they are exceptionally um, susceptible to high levels of copper use now you don't want to go too crazy um, but but copper toxicity is a big problem for them so if you've got some copper oxychloride some coside uh, let me think um, what else sits in that um, liquid copper spray from Yates. You can get any of those. Spray it around the base of the plant, uh, on the ground, and also on the actual trunk itself and, and all around the trunk. And if they come across that and they're moving their way from the ground to the top, what you will find is you will find that they will um, 
they'll die. It'll, it'll clean them out. You have to do it two or three times during, um, ideally sort of late winter, actually, just as the new foliage starts to emerge, just as it's sort of starting to grow and producing flowers. And then as you get your first real growth uh, and fruit set, you need to do it then. That will help enormously. You can try and bait, you can do other things, but this increasing the copper load, um, in the old days, they'd actually use blue stone. So I'm not sure you can still get it these days, but it's basically it's a copper stone, a copper in, in actual um, um, a crystal form. Crush that, spread it around the base. But where you live, you'll get a lot of rainfall during the during the winter months, and that will wash that into the soil a fair bit, which is why you need to reapply. So maybe the Yates liquid copper might be the go. Julia, you're in Victoria too. Um, I was always told to do the hard prune and roses after the worst frosts are over. That's exactly what I was saying, Julia. Um, I always do it at the end of really the last week of July or the first week of August, because where I live, that's usually the last frost you will get. But even if you cut them back then, they're four weeks to five weeks away from growth really emerging and starting to, to come out and potentially be susceptible. So this is a good way for you to avoid that um, damage by waiting until the frosts are gone. Deborah, I'm not sure. Oh, you're in Perth. Um, when do I plant dahlia bulbs? Never planted them before. Okay. Dahlia bulbs are a summer flowering plant. And look, here in Perth, it's a bit different in, in cooler climates. For example, uh, Melbourne, uh, you don't have to worry. Or if you're in the mountains uh, around the outside of Sydney, Again, same thing. Um, you can kind of do them fairly early season. So you're talking October, November. But in Perth, my view is sort of that October, November, December is when you get them into the ground and then they'll grow strongly through the sort of January, February period, flowering in March. And mine are absolutely peaking with their flowers now at home. So we've got dahlias everywhere and they look sensational. There's another benefit, and that is many of the uh, insects, which are generally sort of thrips, um, that do affect dahlias, uh, dahlia flowers. They're actually on a, a waning um, cycle, life cycle, so they're not going to do too much damage to the flowers. That's fairly complex, wasn't it? Matthew, you're in Melbourne West. Uh, one of our five-year-old frangipanis has flowers for the first time, but they've yet to open fully. It's been in that stage for a while now. Is there anything we can do to help them out? I'd love to have a look, Matthew. I have got a magnificent uh, frangipani that I transplanted. It has been growing happily for the best part of 10 or 12 years. This year produced masses of flowers, masses of flowers, in a couple of flushes. The first flush, they all opened. The second flush, so all the buds are all just about there, but not fully opened. And I've been looking at this very little foliage growth. And when I looked, I thought there's something wrong. And I looked down and I noticed that it had been ring barked at ground level. And um, that's it. It's not going to recover. So I was um, I was a little devastated about that. Um, you, you will have noticed earlier on, um, we had a little photo and it had Chloe Van Berkel and myself. And we had these. Yes, zucchinis. And I always think of zucchini as a vegetable and um, and something that you would use basically, you know, in a dish where it's cooked. Um, I suppose what I'm about to tell you is that it can be cooked. Uh, we have uh, a bit of a recipe at home. I'll show you this. Um, for zucchini chocolate cake. Now, this chocolate cake is delicious. Absolutely delicious. And um, the thing about using zucchini in it is that not only do you get the benefit of the vegetable, but you also get that wonderful moisture in the zucchini that makes that cake so moist and so delicious. And um, I brought it in only because we're coming to the end of the season. And when you get to the end of the season, these are probably, that's the size you want to be picking them, ideally, I would suggest. When they get a bit bigger than that, when you start to see a bit of bit of a blush on them they're really getting quite mature and inside the, the seeds starting to set and the reason I, I raise it as my plant of the week or veggie of the week in this particular instance or fruit actually technically it's a fruit um, is because now you want to leave a few of the fruit to get quite large as large as they can let them turn yellow they will actually change color they'll go nice light color and they'll be full of seed and that seed is something you should be collecting now and there's a reason for it 
most of the seed that you buy in packets is grown somewhere else in the world and, and imported to Australia. It's not growing here. But when you've planted that and it grows, if it grows pretty well in the first year, you'll get a great crop. But if what you'll find is the plant, plants are amazing. It'll be taking an imprint of the environment that it's in. It'll be, it'll know how wet it is, when it's wet, how hot and dry it gets, how extreme conditions can be. And it's all set uh, in the next generation of seed, which makes that seed far better adapted to the environment that you're growing in, which is why collecting seed is a really good idea. And this is just one of those plants that you should now be starting to collect the seed, or at least letting the plants um, last fruit of the season mature. So chocolate cake recipe we can supply, collecting seed I can recommend, Zucchini is my plant of the week. Hopefully you liked that. Um, are you growing them at home? How are they? Tyson, they do look yum. They are yum. The cake's amazing. <sighs> yes, very good. And uh, I think we all love chocolate cake. It's um, sort of, you know, always thought it was bad for you, but surely it's good for you if it's made with zucchini, right? Um, all right, I'll get back to answering your questions. I know, I can see them coming through. Let's have a look here. Uh, Leanne, you're in Queensland. Photo is included. Let's have a look at this photo. You revived a rose bush last year. You've been fertilizing, taking care of it, but it won't seem to produce flowers. It doesn't look 100% happy to me, Leanne. Looks like it probably has dried out, I would suggest. It looks like it's also probably in a shady position. Roses have to be in full sun. Roses have to be um, fed on a regular basis. They have to be given good soil uh, because they're so incredibly productive. And if you feed them with a high nitrogen fertilizer, it'll encourage growth, but not necessarily flower. If you feed them um, with a high potassium fertilizer, you'll get less growth, but lots of beautiful flowers. And that's why you go for one of those specialized um, fruit and flowering promoting fertilizers, the flower promoting fertilizers, um, like the guys from Troforte have, I was just looking to see if they've got their azalea camellia mix with us, but I don't have one I can show you, but they really are cool. And uh, it encourages a lot of growth. Now, uh, here's a question for you. I don't know whether you've been following the news, but West Australia had something fairly remarkable happen right up in um, in the Exmouth region yesterday. It was on the news, it was the solar eclipse. Cheryl and Marcus from Mandras sent through a photo of yesterday's solar eclipse through her wisterias and wanted to share it. Let's have a look. Can you see it's a reflection on the ground? You can see how bright that was. That was a pretty incredible thing for those people that had the opportunity to experience it. I was actually down south uh, of, of WA yesterday. I was in Albany, which is the most southern point. And uh, even I actually managed to get a photograph. What I did was I did the silhouette. So I actually put uh, the camera down in front of me, took a photo backwards with the, 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 the sun behind me. And you can just see the silhouette of the moon as it was coming close by. Uh, but we're a long way south. So we, we hardly saw anything, just a bit of a kind of a yellowy sort of, um, um, sort of shade of, of, of color in the sky, I suppose that's, that's all we got. But people in the north, they saw something pretty special. Um, you know, that's uh, something that only happens, the moon and the earth aligned. It's a spectacle you'll see only once every 400 years. In saying that, if you're on the east coast of Australia in five years' time, you have your own coming. And uh, I think that's going to be bigger than Ben-Hur based on what we've just seen. This um, was only seen over the town of... Um, of Exmouth. Exmouth has a population, I think, of about two and a half thousand people. I think the estimates were there were 30,000 people there yesterday to, to have that experience, which is just amazing. All right, we're staying in WA for the moment. Alan, I've uh, got a couple of pandan plants in pots and I've been quite happy with the growth over the past couple of years. Um, and you bring them in, which so pandan is a, is a tropical plant, truly tropical plant. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, what I found with it is that um, it just can't handle the winters and you've solved that by growing them in pots and you bring them indoors in autumn and uh, protect them through the winter nights. Uh, it's been in part shade during the summer nights and you're wondering whether they can withstand the cold weather as they get larger. 
um, or as you continue with what you're doing? It's a good question. My belief is that they will probably acclimatise and get hardier and hardier to those cold conditions. They'll never be fully 100% happy. And if you ever get a really bad cold winter, there's a risk that you might lose them, Alan. Um, but my experience has been that um, there are really classic tropical plants that eventually uh, will evolve and establish here uh, in, in a completely different environment. A good example would be in Perth, at Government House, uh, there is a coconut palm growing in those gardens. Coconut palms technically shouldn't grow anywhere where the temperatures of the soil during winter gets below 10 degrees Celsius and we would get to three or four degrees uh, Celsius during winter. So that shouldn't survive, it shouldn't thrive, but it is. And that's gotta be something to do with just being in the right spot, right amount of sunlight coming through during the winter months and it's just getting it through. So maybe just test them, just test them, Alan. If you start to see them go a bit, uh, bit pale, they lose their sheen, bring them inside. When are you coming to Fagan Park again? Love to have you, thanks, Jeffrey. Um, Sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it's a great spot. Hey, Leah, you're in Brisbane. Thanks very much. You're planting out lillian bulbs this, this weekend. And that's um, that's probably not too late. They will do pretty darn well, to be quite honest. They are a summer flowering bulb, but you'll still be pretty good, I would have thought, in Brisbane. Do I add organic matter at planting time or later on? So in actual fact, with lillian bulbs, if the soil's good if your soil's relatively you know um organic and, and and it's doing quite well um you don't really need to add a lot more you see all the goodness is in the bulb already what you want to do is plant the bulb let it come up let it flower as soon as it's finished flowering then feed it then maybe add a bit of bit of uh, compost around the outside as well and you'll get um get really really good bulb development as a as a consequence of that so the next time they flower, they'll do even better. You also mentioned you've just planted zucchini seeds and they seem to grow better during the winter in the subtropics. And that's so true. So this is the amazing thing about Australia is we've got such diverse climatic range, which is one of the reasons why I always ask you, please let me know. I do have some experience in the tropics uh, and I obviously have some experience in the, in the southern states, but... Um, I kind of probably sit in the middle. So I'm, I'm where I grow. Um, I have the ability to grow cool climate plants like cherries, warm climate plants like pawpaw and banana and um, what else? Mangoes as a good example. So it's a very interesting climatic range that I have. We are very fortunate to live in this amazing country we call Australia. It is just incredible. All right, so let's keep rolling on Mel. Thanks very much for your comment. Thank you for this show. Never knew that Garden Express um, existed until listening here. We just ordered a red tamarillo tree re recently, um, delivered, and now your fuchsias are in transit and we'll be here next week. Mel, thanks so much for that. You know, uh, I, I've known uh, I've known Chloe and, and Rowan and particularly David for a long time now. This is a wonderful family business. And, um, and so you know, Garden Gurus, this is my family business. So, um, you know, I really love working with people who are out there uh, putting so much effort into into servicing their customers. In a family business, you can't afford to be to, to, to let people down. You have to exceed their expectations all the time. And that's what the Van Burkle family have done for four generations in Australia for over 70 years. It's, it's incredible. And I think probably the most remarkable thing for me is that this is a family that were a traditional grower, if you like. Uh, uh, they grew cut flowers and then then bulbs, and then um, you know they started to evolve to do some other things. Um, but then they evolved into into that that world of IT. And one of the things I've sort of said to them is that you have to be a bit careful that you don't think you know people don't think that Garden Express is just some big online entity um, that's you know impersonable because. These guys are so personable. They're just so friendly and so keen to see you do well. I thought when uh, when Chloe came to uh, came to Perth, I said, "Please come in and be part of this. It'd be lovely to introduce you to you guys." So I hope you understand um, what I was trying to do there, and, and uh, so that you can see that there's real people behind this company. They are really lovely people. 
Okay, we have got lots of questions coming through. They're flying at us, and I'm going to try and answer them all for you. We've got 15 minutes, so let's do it. Uh, Binette is in Balladura. Hello. One of my dragon fruit has split on the vine. Could you tell me what happened to it, please? You are watering them too much, Binette. If, um, when the fruit sets, it's set to get to a certain size. But what often happens is we see the flowers coming on and we give them a little bit of an extra hand water or, you know, maybe there's been a bit of extra rainfall a little bit earlier. Um, maybe there was a bit of fertiliser also um, put down that was more than the year before or when the flower actually set the fruit. Because at that moment in time, as soon as the flower has pollinated and the fruit is set, it's set to be a certain size. But if you give it more moisture and more nutrient, the fruit will grow bigger and that forces it to split open. And it's not an uncommon thing at all, to be quite honest, because of when they flower um, here in WA or, or even, you know, in, in New South Wales and certainly in Queensland and, and the north of the country. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it. I would let it get to the sort of full size and I'd pick it because it doesn't matter. You can cut around the outside of where the split is and uh, the rest of it will taste amazing. Abby, you are in Melbourne. Please help. My Sir Walter grass is dying. Um, it's under your crab apple tree. How can I make the grass grow? Every second branch or every third branch of your crab apple tree, go through and prune them off. Thin the tree out so you allow light through. Sir Walter requires a minimum of really ideally eight hours a day of, of direct sunlight. As soon as it gets less than that, it starts getting thin. And um, the thinner it gets, the more susceptible it is to all sorts of problems. Hopefully that helps just a little bit. Kerry, you're in Raleigh Stone. A plant of pumpkin and cucumbers at the beginning of the season seem to flower a lot, but the flowers either fell off um, or bitten off or not, um, but not eaten. My husband seems to think it was quenders by any... So quenders are also known as bandicoots. And uh, it's a good question. I... I've got quenders in my garden, and I'm certainly getting a lot of um, a lot of cucumbers, a lot of pumpkin, a lot, a lot of uh, you know all the cucurbits to be quite honest. And a lot of these guys, there's zucchinis. They're, they're it's been an amazing season of um, of fruit pr production, but I don't think it's quenders. What I suspect it is is probably a lack of potassium. That's the you know when you look at your fertilizer mix, it says NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus potassium and potassium is the one that sweetens fruit that makes fruit larger um, and that encourages flowering so really i suspect uh, and we're getting some I, I should mention the last few weeks we're getting people coming to us from all over the world which is absolutely sensational but one of the the, the great um questions that those people would be asking is what's a quenda what's a bandicoot it's a small marsupial about this big and they tend to uh, dig up little patches in in the garden they eat grubs that are in the soil so they're, they're eating often some of those bugs that cause some problems so um, that's just for your information I am a gift bearer from the USA uh, coming to us via YouTube second week in a row thanks so much for joining us have you got any suggestions for getting rid of borers? My peaches are attacked every year, uh, and so I've not got them bigger than golf ball size before they get a hole in them, and then they drop off. It's just be like you're saying they're boring into the fruit. Now, you spray this morning with neem oil, um, which, okay, that's um, that's okay. Uh, I'm not sure that, that neem oil will really solve this problem. There is a, a chemical that I believe you can still get in the US called fenthian. Um, it's sold, it was sold in Australia as levasage. You can't get it anymore. That may be an option. The other option, and the one that I would recommend that you look at um, seriously, there's a product called Success. And it uses a, um, it uses a biological uh, active ingredient. So it's, um, it's not very toxic. And it's really effective at taking out grubs. And I think that what you've got is something fairly similar to the kind of fruit borers that we get, which are more often than not flies. So hopefully that helps. Um, 
And uh, look, I'm loving your feedback this morning. Thanks. I always take a bit of a risk when I'm sort of saying things like, um, okay, I'm going to bring somebody in from Garden Express and introduce them to you. But um, Christine Rankin, um, they are amazing at Garden Express. I agree with you. My bulbs are arriving next week and they actually phoned me to let me know that they had problems with the carpet roses and offered a refund or something else instead. The refund came through within a couple of days. Very impressed. We were all blown away with just how popular the flower carpet story was. You know, what a great story. Um, Anthony Tesla is somebody who I have enormous respect for. Um, he's got immense passion. If you think that I'm passionate about, uh, and I have huge amounts of energy about what we talk about, Anthony blows me away. And his ability to identify unique plants and plants that have been trialled properly, and then he trials them all around the world, Flower Carpet is the success story. So it's just been entered into um, the the World Hall, uh, Hall of Fame the, the as, as one of, well, the very first, actually, landscape rose. And, of course, it's a great collection of them. So we did a story on the Garden Gurus on TV only for everybody to go, we want to get our hands on them. The guys at Garden Express had a great offer, so we put that on the show so you could get some. And they sold out like crazy. In fact, they've sold out all over the country at the moment. So growers are now madly propagating and growing more plants for you. So you'll have them come springtime. Sorry about that, Christina. But they are really lovely, uh, the team at Garden Express, which is why I introduced you to Chloe. Okay, uh, let's keep moving along. Dr. Davina, which is the sweetest variety of strawberry to grow? Well, it's a good question. There's a lot of variation in strawberries. Um, I'm going to be a little bit uh, old fashioned and probably tell you two of my favorites, which are a little bit older these days. Red gauntlet is one of them, not a big fruit, but um, really sweet. And tioga, which is a bigger fruit, and if left on the vine to, to ripen, incredibly sweet. So they're, they're my personal preference. However, there are so many new varieties coming through. These varieties are chosen not just for the sweetness of the fruit, but also their disease resistance, very important. Um, that you get yourself virus index strawberry runners when you're planting. And I should qualify that by saying, if your strawberries have insect attacks, whatever insect, whether it be snail slugs or whatever, and you have to spray them, strawberry as a fruit is one of the ultimate absorbers. They will absorb external chemicals into the flesh um, you know, quickly and, and hold it for a long period of time. That's a significant problem. And... Um, that's why if you can find a way to, to keep them separated from bugs in any way, if you can avoid having to spray fungicides, which a lot of the breeding is working on, making them far more resistant to some of the, the fungal diseases that they get, um, it just means that you're not being exposed to chemicals when you're eating these delicious fruit. You know, the, uh, the, the French, the, the name uh, for strawberry in France is fraiseberry. It's not strawberry. It was the English that called them strawberries because when the English fruit buyers would go and see them being grown in the field, the French would have all the straw packed in around the outside of the plants. That was to stop snails and slugs getting in and eating the fruit. It was a natural protection. Snails and slugs don't like dry straw. So hence the English looked at them and called them strawberries, these delicious strawberries. So there's a little bit of a, a background story for you. And Dr. Davina, continuing on, I'm just going to quickly answer the second question for you. Can How to plant bare-rooted plants? Please explain Garden Express only sends bare-rooted plants. They don't only send bare-rooted plants, but I think with strawberries they do. Trick is really good quality soil. And honestly, uh, if you're going to grow them, I love growing strawberries in pots and I only use really high quality potting mix. Very important. Um, the better the potting mix, the better the results. So um, that's the key with strawberries. I hope that helps. Rita, you're in Kareen. Um, how can I tell if my lemon tree has gall wasp? The fruit is been much smaller than usual. It's been some marks on some of the skins. Apparently there's been some activity in your area. Gall wasp is noticeable because of the stems and you'll see these big knots start to occur in the stems, like big lumps in the wood that's the wasp and it's, it's laid the seed inside and the larvae is inside and it causes this knotting and eventually the whole tree becomes very very knotted and you'll find branches die off and it looks all stunted and it's not healthy and that's the gall wasp the best thing to do is when you start to see those galls appear 
cut them off. But I don't think you've got that problem. I think your problem is probably related to fertilizer and water. Remembering in Perth, um, we didn't have any rain at all, zero mils, January and February. And, and March, we started to get some rainfall, still below average. Now we're getting really good rainfall, but what you're seeing is, is that that plant recovering and uh, it's only gonna produce certain size fruit now. Um, but giving it a good feed at the end of the fruiting season, will set it up for a good year next year. And that's what you should be worried about. Leah, I got some beautiful hippie ashrams from Garden Express last year. The dark burgundy one has put on three flower stems. I've got a dark burgundy one from them as well. David sent me some year before last, I think it was. This year, uh, I've got one with four flower stems on it. Hippie astrums are beautiful, but very few of us realize just how gorgeous that particular flowering bulb is how easy it is to grow and how well suited it is to our environment. So again, I'd be looking to get my hands on those the next time Garden Express put them up for sale. I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Um, okay, so Jenny is in uh, Vincentia, south coast of New South Wales. Uh, she's got watermelon, flowers uh, not turning to fruit. Uh, that could simply be humidity. It should be dry now. You should actually be seeing a fair bit of fruit development, to be quite honest. Um, but that is, um, that's one of the challenges. Uh, I think um, Shaylee's just letting me know how many questions are still to come. There are lots, and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get to all of you today, but I'll do my very best to belt through them over the next five minutes. Kerry, you're in Uchuka in Victoria. Uh, good afternoon, we're going over two weeks, four to five weeks. I'm worried my garden and pot plants will be fried by the time we get home. Is there something I can buy to help it stay hydrated? Put them into a tray, first thing, put them into a tray, Fill the, you know, make sure you soak the pot. I take the pot out, put it into a bucket of water, soak the pot thoroughly, put it back into the tray. Water will flow through, it'll go into the tray, it'll be drawn back up. That's gonna protect, that's gonna keep them looking good for about two weeks. Then they're gonna start to stress. There's not a lot more you can do. There are some bottles, you can get these little spikes and you put them on the plastic drink bottles, pop them on top and they'll drip in slowly over a two week period as well. But three weeks kind of crosses a line. You need to get somebody in to give them a hand water for you. John, you're in Melbourne. Last year, I got rust and holes in my broad beans. Also get much the same on my broccoli. As a preventative, any advice would be much appreciated. Okay, those copper-based sprays are really good. So again, Coside is my recommendation. Give them a bit of a spray with Coside. It just keeps them clean of a lot of the diseases. Usually that shot hole stuff is actually caused by a bacterial disease, not a fungal disease, but it doesn't matter if you're using copper, bacteria and fungus, both of them are knocked back. Chidina, you're in Kalgoorlie. Great to have somebody from Kalgoorlie. Chili thrip, awful, awful bug. Definitely doing a lot of damage, particularly to rose flowers. Um, Predatory insects, there are certainly some out there. You could use those um, and you can get them online. The Good Bug Company, do a bit of bit of uh, Googling. Um, sprays, you can spray, but we're coming into winter and in a short period of time, you're gonna find they're gonna go dormant and you'll be printing off the, the damaged wood and it'll be springtime when you need to treat them again. I would get some predatory bugs in spring springtime and prune off the damaged foliage. Clary, you are in Narang in Queensland, got two small magnolia trees. One started dropping its buds, the other one much darker leaves and no buds. Give me advice on what to do. I'd say one's getting more nitrogen. The other one is probably lacking food. It, if it's dropping buds, it's just got enough nutrient, not enough nutrient in the soil, probably not enough water. That will help enormously. A bit of mulching might help as well. Doris, you're in Shepparton in Victoria. Can I grow passion fruit from seedlings that have come up under the trellis? Um, as long as they're a proper black passion fruit, absolutely. Um, Christine, thanks so much. Awesome show as usual. Thanks for the advice of the Frangipani. Love the interaction between everybody. I do too. I love it when you guys are also supporting each other. It is great. We are a community and that's um, it's what we should do. We should work to support each other so we enjoy more garden success. Karen, speaking of garden success, you're a beginner. You're in, you're in Adelaide. Um, what's the best thing to get started off with? Well, growing veggies at home is always a really good way to get started. I would suggest that you, you do that. Okay, let's keep rolling along. Are we going to the competition draw now? Is that the plan at this point? 
I reckon we've got a few more questions. We've got a lot coming through. Glenis, you're in central Victoria. Hello, gurus. I'd like some help with reusing soil. Search online, but I can't find anything. So basically, what I'd like to know is what vegetables and herbs can I grow in a soil that's previously grown tomatoes in? Uh, and, and this is potting mix. So you're in central Victoria and you need to know what is available to grow in your region in pots. Okay, Glenis, first thing, tomatoes are part of the solanaceous family. So the things that you will not grow in that same pot are plants from that family. And that includes things like eggplants, as an example. Um, what you could grow is some of the leafy green vegetables, but even then you need to be enriching that soil, that potting soil with some really good controlled release fertilizer. And um, my suggestion is um, there is a product that comes from the guys at Troforte that's all about encouraging, um, uh, I suppose, a rejuvenation of old soil, tired soil. And um, it's one that you uh, want to keep your eye out for. It's called Rejuvenator and um, really, really good. You'll find it from independent garden centers. That's where they sell that. This is our last question for today. I've got the wind up. Christy is in Palm Woods in Queensland. We have moved into a new house. We've laid new turf over 500 square meters. How often should I be watering it? And when would you recommend doing the first mow? Also, where we are has a problem with lawn grubs. What can I do to help the new turf thrive, stop the lawn grubs attacking it? Couple of things for you. They're really good points. First thing is you want to be watering for the first week, two to three times a day. Second, as, as long as there's no rain around, of course. Uh, second week, probably twice a day. Third week, once a day. Fourth week, every second day. And hopefully by the fifth or sixth week, you know, you probably twice a week is all you really need for that, that amount of lawn. Um, as far as mowing goes, it won't hurt after about week two to three, just going into three to start mowing. Don't mow low. Keep a little bit on the higher side to allow those roots to keep developing. Remember, all the leaf uh, on the top is being supported by roots below. So um, keep it keep it sort of um, neat and tidy, but don't cut it down hard. Now, I reckon that that's gotta be one of the, the best questions. And the second part of your question is why I think it's so important. And that is lawn grubs are a problem. African black beetle, uh, lawn army worm, they can be pretty active sort of from February through to sort of the end of April um, in different parts of the country. And they're the ones that leave those dead patches in your lawn and literally the lawn will turn white. Now, getting control of that is, it's gotta be done two ways. One is you need to be conscious that if you think that there's grubs there, how do you find out if they're really there? So just on dusk, just as it's starting to get dark, soak the patch where you're seeing the patch where the dead patches are coming through. Literally soak it, let the lawn flood. The grubs will come to the surface. That's the first way to find out. Um, the second part of that is that don't turn external lights on at night if you're in an area that is actually quite susceptible. It's really quite problematic. Um, and probably the, the last thing is if you really think you've got um, got a bit of a problem and you've got some grubs, take them into your local garden center and just show them, just keep them in a little jar and just say, you know, is this what I think it is? And then they'll give you a systemic, it's basically a, a hose on um, lawn grub treatment and you can take them out and that'll allow your lawn to develop its root system properly. Now, do you know what? Shay Lee has been very generous today. She's done a great job producing, as she always does, but um, she's also asked me to ask one more, or answer one more question. Do you see Mia, now you're in Queensland, you've got an evergreen white frangipani. The evergreen, meaning that it keeps its leaves on it all year. There's two types of frangipani, well, there's a few actually, but the two most common ones of the broadleaf frangipanis is a cutifolia, that's the one that's got the pointed leaves, and then there's the obtusa, which has got a rounded leaf, and that's the evergreen form. Um, it's been growing in a pot and it never flowers. And you just came back from 12 days abroad and noticed some thick white stuff on some of the leaves. It sounds to me like something's attacking the leaves because the thick white stuff will be the sap oozing out. So go out at night, do see Mia, and take a torch and then have a look at what's in and around that plant because you will see this some kind of bug on that. It could be as an in innocuous as um, maybe an aphid or possibly could be mealybug, 
but you will see them active at night. Um, and certainly if it's anything bigger than that, you'll really notice it. So hopefully that helps. Now, the winners of our questions. Um, let's have a look with well, a $50 gift voucher from Garden Express. It's a great, great prize. Um, Dr. Davina was asked a pretty good question. The sweetest variety of strawberry to grow. Alan from WA, um, he asked about pandan plants. Now that's pretty darn good. And Kerry from Rolly Stone, um, she asked the question about pumpkin and cucumbers. But Alan, I think you got it this week. Pandan is a very unusual tropical plant um, for cooler climates to grow. And uh, with that, you will win that $50 voucher. We will be in touch with you after the show to organise uh, delivery of that. So you can go shopping at Garden Express. You can do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and there's a huge range of all sorts of plants, not just bulbs that you can get from them. So um, yeah, so well done, mate, congratulations. Now, Troforte, we run that competition every week and you're probably wondering, what is the code word? Now, remember, you have to go to Troforte's Facebook page. There's a link in the description of this live and you need to like the comment um, and look, like the page, make sure you like the Troforte page. They put up some great information. Sometimes it's quite technical. Sometimes it's really practical, but it's always interesting. So check it out, make sure you like them and then you'll get regular updates from them. And of course, the, the code word that you need to put in on the, on the, uh, on the page is pruning. That is pruning. You can see it right there on the screen. Good luck, it's a great prize, $250 worth of Troforte, which will keep your garden looking great all year long. Okay, well, I reckon we are just about there for today's show. Uh, it's been a great show, and we've had so many questions. I was so thrilled to bring Chloe in earlier on in the, in the session. Um, she did a great job, as I said to you, she was actually really nervous, which she shouldn't be. She's uh, a wealth of knowledge and an absolutely lovely human being. So um, it was great to be able to introduce you. We are going to be back next week and I will be back next week with another great live show. And of course, if you want to know anything from any of the things that we've done on The Garden Gurus, um, all you have to do is check out our webpage. Um, and you can watch this and uh, you can watch, uh, you know, stories from the shows, episodes on thegardengurus.tv on our YouTube channel. And tomorrow we have um, episode six of The Garden Gurus uh, on Channel 9. It's, it's a great episode. Nige is out of control this week. He's the funniest guy ever, I reckon. Um, he's really having a lot of fun. We've got some great stories. You will love them. But before I go today, there's one more little bonus for you. I uh, want to say goodbye, but I want to leave you with an interview I did with Tim Entwistle. He's an amazing guy, incredibly intelligent horticulturalist, botanist, who looks after some of the most important gardens in all of the country, right in Victoria. So here we go. Here comes Tim. Happy gardening, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Tim Entwistle is our guest this morning here on The Garden Gurus Live. And Tim, you're coming to us uh, out of Melbourne. Tell us a little bit about your role and your background. Yeah, look, I'm lucky enough to be the Director and Chief Executive of Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria, which means I look after Melbourne Gardens and Cranbourne Gardens. So we've got this beautiful heritage garden, 38 hectares that's been here since 1846, and Cranbourne, which is you know, very new, uh, interesting, innovative kind of design, but full of Australian plants. So I do get the best of both worlds, uh, you know, an old garden and a new garden. It's a beautiful, uh, certainly uh, both both Melbourne and Cranbourne are just amazing gardens. And I know that uh, the, the latter is a is a new and, and, and developing garden. But as you mentioned, the design there is is so innovative. And there's an article you've written just recently uh, that I, I found really fascinating. Seven facts, um, the nature's, you know, good for you. And you think we would all sort of realise that, but we tend to lose track of it, particularly when we're living in big cities, don't we? It's sort of obvious in some ways, and you, you don't need the science. You know, it seems a bit weird in some ways to do research, to discover that it's, it's you feel better when you're out in, in nature or out in gardens, because we know that. We have wonderful places. We feel refreshed, kind of revitalised. And what's really interesting and what that article was around was, you know, they 
the studies that are showing, you know, I suppose confirming our suspicions that it's good to be yeah. out there, but also more subtly that uh, we actually do feel calmer. There are places to uh, feel healthier. The places can actually help people who are sick get healthier. So they do help in um, recovery. And certainly hospitals are very aware of this now. And and then and also as places and spaces to meet people, there's sort of so many little aspects to why a garden and a and a big open park, but also particularly why a botanic garden, I think, can uh, can make a, make a difference and really make us feel better and, and help our general health. Uh, botanical gardens are one of the great treasures that um, many of our cities have over here in Perth. We have, and I'm not far away from it, we have King's Park. So I, I spend a lot of time uh, when I can just taking a bit of a walk through King's Park and, and there is that sense of calm and and uh, relaxation that comes from that. It's it's probably just purely sometimes that that uh, beautiful fresh air in the heart of a big city um, and that, that lovely environment. But, you know, at home, people can recreate these environments as well. And, and even, you know, on a small basis, uh, get themselves back into nature as well. And that's an important message. I think that's very important for everybody as well, isn't it? In your home garden, you know, trying to get a bit of variety is a good thing. And I think that stimulates you both as a gardener and then also when you contemplate that landscape and, and having a place that you're tending to and caring for. Now, with a, a botanic garden, you know, we've got the team here who look after it on behalf of the community, and that's that's great. But there is that extra layer. So in some ways, I think a, a garden, you've got that extra dimension where you are interacting with that garden. You, you, know, you know that plant. I just... I love that when you plant something and you watch it grow and you come back year after year, month after month, depending on what kind of, you know, trees are fantastic for this, where you watch them grow. And to me, that's an experience like no other. I, I did find that, um, that the article that you've written here was one that, um, that could apply both obviously to botanical gardens and, and encourage people to get out and explore them a bit more, but also, you know, reinforce that importance in big cities that um, that we should be sort of connecting with nature on a regular basis. Yeah, and there's so many places we can do that. I mean, there's the home garden, there's the uh, the landscape outside in your streets, and there are your, lo your local parks, and there are, you know, and some people will have balconies and they'll be putting some pots on there. And that's, I think, just as, as important in terms of bringing this nature into your home and into your life. And some of those aspects of the, the benefits of nature uh, you know, it can be gained from having a pot in front of you, just being, uh, it might be sitting there while you're doing the dishes or cooking dinner and there's a, a, a plant in front of you just kind of grounding you again. It's a, a real connection with nature, which we think does have a kind of intrinsic um, meaning to us as humans and, and animals on the planet, this, this link to nature that we've divorced a little bit, of course, if we live in urban areas and, and most of us in houses. So we've create a distance between us so bringing that back in um is not a you know not such a silly thing you know it, there's a there's probably a, a kind of inherent evolutionary advantage or logic at least to having that connection and grounding us there tim it, it's a really it's a really interesting article and you've you've been quite prolific you do write you you obviously uh express your thoughts in in the written form how do people um follow you and 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 follow some of these articles yeah, look, I, I do blog quite regularly, so they can follow me on a thing called Talking Plants if they look that up. Uh, and the interestingly, just recently in the last year, I've written a book, uh, a memoir, but it's it's called Evergreen: The Botanical Life of a Plant Punk. But particularly relevant to this conversation, it starts with a bit of a, a chat around botanic gardens and where they started, and, and a visit I made to one in in Padua, in in the first modern botanic garden in Italy. And what then then sort of turning into what what it makes a good botanic garden and why are they important? Some of the things we're talking about today. Tim, um, I have to have to wind us up, unfortunately, but look, it's been so lovely chatting to you and I really appreciate your time. And, and it's a wonderful article. So hopefully uh, we can get a few people uh, following Talking Plants and uh, looking out for you on Radio National and Gardening Australia with your articles as well. Thanks very much, Trevor. Great to chat. Great catching up, mate. Thank you.